The Avengers. That's what we call ourselves. Sort of like a team. Earth's mightiest heroes type thing. Avengers, time to work for a living. That's my secret. I'm always angry. I am on the side of life. You get hurt, hurt them back. You get killed, walk it off. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. I'm your host, Andrew, and I'm here to talk to you about the Avengers. Welcome to episode 38 of Some Assembly Required, your weekly adventure into the annals of Earth's mightiest heroes, the Avengers. This week, we're taking a look at Avengers number 35, The Light That Faded. This week's issue is written by Roy Thomas, art by Don Heck, letters by Sam Rosen, and edits by Stan Lee. And it comes to us in December of 1966. That's right, folks, this is our first issue that is not written by Stan Lee. If you remember back to issue number 24, in the letters column, Marvel announced that fan Roy Thomas had joined the Marvel staff as a writer. And I mentioned back then that Thomas will eventually come on to join the Avengers. And this is the point at which Thomas takes over from Stan Lee. And Thomas will write a fairly significant run of Avengers. As for the departing Stan Lee, obviously he is the editor of... Of Marvel Comics and will be that way for quite a while and we'll touch more on that at the end of the episode here in Stan's contributions to the Avengers. Taking a look at our cover, again, I find it far too Goliath-centric. Having said that, everything else about this cover I really like. If I had designed this cover, I would have reversed the position of the Living Laser and of Goliath, bring the villain front and center as opposed to a background character, but otherwise I would have left Captain America and Hawkeye where they are. I really like the action involved, and I love the color. Picking up where we left off last issue, Hawkeye and Captain America are imprisoned by the living laser, and the lasers that make up the bars of their cage are slowly changing angle and creeping in on Cap and Hawkeye, such that in a very short period of time they're going to be disintegrated by lasers. That doesn't really seem like an enjoyable result, so I can understand why Hawkeye and Captain America are trying to get out, though Hawkeye's a little bit more fatalistic about what's going on on than Captain America. In general, I think I chalk that up to the fact that although Hawkeye's been on the team for a little while now, Captain America's got a significantly larger experience base from which to draw on, and Cap has been in situations not exactly like this, but similar to this life and death kind of situations that he's gotten out of, so he's a little less willing to accept the inevitable. So Cap realizes that if he can get to the controls for the laser somehow, he can get the lasers to change their angle back and at least prevent them from dying you know once the avengers have staved off death that then buys them some time to figure out how to get out of their prison so cap remembers that his shield is now coated in a laser deflecting laser absorbing material but he's not sure if there's still enough on there after taking several blasts from the living laser cap thinks that most of that material has burned off but he wants to give it a try anyways so he tries to jam his shield into the bars and after only a couple of seconds Cap's shield actually disintegrates it's gone and of course Cap's immediate thought is oh I should have just thrown my shield and you know my thought on that is yeah that's a great plan I don't know why that wasn't our first plan here yeah there's a little bit of a risk in that if he throws his shield and it doesn't disable the lasers or stop them from moving then they're really in a bind but at the same time Cap just risked everything and and lost he tried to get himself free to get to the controls and that didn't work so now he has no other options also Cap has no shield now right right Well, that's not entirely the case. So as most of my research has indicated, it's generally accepted that Cap swapped out shields for a substitute shield that had this special coating on it. And we will actually see later in the issue that Cap does in fact have his regular shield and that it wasn't indeed destroyed. So while Cap and Hawkeye strain to come up with something else that may, at the last minute, save them, we cut to Goliath, who is attempting to track down his fellow Avengers, specifically Wasp, who, among the three Avengers that we saw last issue facing off against the Living Laser, was apparently the only one to have enough common sense to activate her emergency signal. Go Wasp! Now, in order to track down this emergency signal, Goliath is using a locating device that is contained within his belt, and one of the primary pieces of equipment that is within this locator is a compass. Now, I have two small problems here. 
One, generally speaking, a compass needs to be laid flat in order for it to be useful. Though, I will accept the idea that perhaps this is not an actual compass, but instead an indication of what direction Goliath should run. Secondly, and somewhat more importantly, how is he seeing this? I mean, I understand that I'm kind of a larger guy, and so it's harder for me to see my belt in general. However, I accept that it's just generally difficult to stare at one's belly button while trying to run and figure out where someone or something is. It might be a convenient story location for this device, but it probably should be like removable or something so that Goliath can more easily make use of it. So as Goliath is tracking down this emergency signal, the living laser along with Wasp vacate the premises of the building that they were in, leaving Cap and Hawkeye to be killed by the lasers. And it's getting really close here. But just in the nick of time, Goliath comes crashing through the wall and manages to disable the laser bars just in time. Now originally, looking at the panel of of Goliath crashing through the wall, I actually thought that this was a reused panel from the last issue when Goliath smashes through the wall of the laboratory on his way out into the park. And I'm very pleased to note that it is not the same panel. It's a similarly drawn panel and the coloring is the same, the red background, the green debris, but it's not actually the same panel. I had to go back and check because of how close these two panels were, at least in my mind. And they're similar, but not the same. Now, once Goliath has freed Cap and Hawkeye, he starts reading them the riot act about letting the living laser escape with Wasp. And he actually says, I should have let you wash out's roast and gone after her. And Hawkeye and Cap are both kind of perturbed about this, though Cap seems to keep his wits about him. Hawkeye gets ready to take on Goliath again. And really, it's Captain America that keeps things from coming to blows, in part because he holds back Hawkeye. Then he also talks a little bit of sense and makes Goliath kind of realize what he just said and how not cool it was. I think we can all understand that Goliath is generally upset about what's going on and wants to protect Wasp, but he's also really gone from being protective of Wasp and, and doting on Wasp to being really grossly overprotective. As a married man, I can understand where Goliath's anger is coming from. But he makes some really unfounded and very serious accusations against his teammates for malicious actions. The fact that they let Wasp go and blaming them when it's really unfounded, especially given the fact that Cap and Hawkeye have repeatedly demonstrated a concern for Wasp's safety, especially on the couple of occasions where Goliath has just run off because he was in a pissy mood because he is stuck at 10 feet tall. So while Goliath was saving his fellow Avengers, unfortunately, he lost the signal from Wasp's emergency beacon, and Captain America recommends that they go back to Avengers Mansion, and instead of using the portable equipment that they're currently using, they go and they use the more heavy duty stuff they've got in the lab. Unfortunately, even with that, they are unable to find Wasp's signal. And Goliath despairs a bit, and Cap reminds him, now is not the time for rash threats and for this kind of worrying. We need to find the living laser, and when we find him, we will probably be able to find Wasp. Although Goliath acknowledges what Cap is saying, it's very clear that there is a very real potential Goliath will cross a line with the living laser. So in general, the Avengers don't kill. Really, they don't even seriously injure. Goliath makes it very clear that he has no qualms about any of that right now. All that matters to him is Janet. And while I get that, it's a little worrisome. It's just another one of those things that adds to Goliath's personality and the issues he will have in the future. As a hero, he has a certain defined role and certain limits that he is unwilling to violate. In theory, right? Heroes have a code of conduct. Goliath's statements here indicate that as far as Wasp is concerned, that code is far more malleable. Now, across town, we find Wasp in the Living Laser's hidden laboratory, and she's kept inside of some kind of jar or small containment vessel that is, again, surrounded by lasers, so that if she tries to change her size, she would encounter these lasers and would be injured or killed. So that's really an encouragement for her not to try and change size. So while Wasp is 
contemplating what she's going to do about this situation, the Living Laser is approached by two gentlemen who are the leaders of a group of rebels in a South American country known as Costa Verde. And these two gentlemen want the Living Laser's help in removing the vile dictator. And the Living Laser agrees, however, he has no qualms and no holdups about what's actually going on in that, yes, he's helping remove the dictator from power, but he's fully aware that the reality he here is that these two gentlemen intend to take power. So he's really removing one dictator and replacing them with two. And I kind of like that about the Living Laser. Not only is he not naive, he's fully aware and he doesn't care because it, it means nothing to him. Costa Verde is, at least to start this issue, not the prize. He has no desires on it. He's doing it A, for the money, and B, for the notoriety it will bring him. Now, in his mind, he's already killed two Avengers and captured a third. So in addition to that, then he will have overthrown a vile dictator in a matter of hours. That's a, that's a pretty good name for oneself. Now, obviously, there are a lot of political commentaries here regarding, especially actions taken by the U.S., and specifically like the CIA in South American countries where they'll prop up dictators and things like that. And I'm really not going to go into that, mostly because it's immaterial to the bulk of this issue, although he does successfully overthrow this dictator. Really, for the living laser, the politics of nothing to do with his actions. He is merely doing it to make a name for himself. Now, of course, these two men wouldn't be dastardly plotting rebels if they weren't also planning to betray the Living Laser, which we see them discussing, and how once they have the country in hand, they have no plans to keep him around or to pay him or anything. We'll see these two gentlemen and their plans come back later in the issue. So before leaving for Costa Verde, the Living Laser once again confronts Wasp. Only this time Wasp is really quite confused. At this point, the Living Laser refers to Wasp as his beloved. And as far as Wasp knows, she's never seen this guy before in her life. But she's also convinced that he is entirely serious, that he means everything he's saying. Now, obviously, we know who the Living Laser is and we know how he came to be in love with Wasp. But for her, this has got to be pretty damn confusing. And she will eventually find out who the Living Laser actually is. But in the meantime, the Living Laser will make his way to Costa Verde and rather rapidly defeat the federal troops of the dictator. There's a couple of great panels here. One of them is the Living Laser blasting a tank that reminds me a lot of images of the old Soviet T-72 tanks being taken out during the first Gulf War. And the second panel is of one of the federal troop commanders calling into headquarters to inform the general of what's going on, and the commander is very, very reminiscent of Fidel Castro. So, although I'm not going to dive into the politics of American foreign policy of the 1960s, obviously the, the implication here is that the dictator of Costa Verde is, in fact, a communist, and that overthrowing this government is not necessarily the worst thing in the world that the Living Laser could do. And we see a meeting between the Living Laser and some of the rebels, what appears to be the same two gentlemen he met in New York, in which the Living Laser lays out his plans for finishing off the dictator's army and the creation of a laser cannon, which he is making. He actually refers to it as a mammoth cannon, which, as we'll see later, it is a pretty impressive laser cannon. Now, what I don't like about this is that the rebels are all portrayed in really stereotypical South American, really stereotypical mechanism. Mexican fashion. They look like they should be riding with Pancho Villa in the 19-teens. And this is messed up on a couple of reasons. One, again, it's very stereotypical and not really fitting of the time period. It's a very antiquated notion of what these gentlemen should be wearing. And the clothes that they're wearing and the look is very specifically Mexican. Like I mentioned, it's similar to what Pancho Villa wore. And Costa Verde is a fill in a substitute for any random small South American country. So much of the way that a lot of Asian cultures just get mashed together as one giant amalgamation of Eastern culture. The same thing is happening here with these rebels in that they are basically becoming one amalgamation of what South American culture is. We also see the dictator, and in the course of a single panel, the general refuses to abdicate and then states that he has n no choice but to throw himself at the mercy of the traitor Valdez. It's a really rapid flip 
on the part of the dictator. Now, to be fair, the dictator holding out or not holding out is really immaterial to the story as a whole. So I understand why we did it in one panel. It's just very odd in like four sentences that the general goes from I would never abdicate to I must throw myself at the mercy of the victor. Now, of course, the overthrow of a small South American country by a supervillain makes the news in the Marvel Universe thanks to the Marvel Press Corps, and word quickly reaches the Avengers that they have in fact located the living laser, that he is behind everything that's going on in Costa Verde. So the Avengers jump in their aero car and make their way to Costa Verde. On the way, there is a great panel as you just see the aero car flying along the New York skyline, and Hawkeye says, I was just thinking about all these classy go buggies that Tony Stark keeps turning out for us. No wonder you don't read about him going to the Playboy Club anymore. And it's a very meta panel in that Hawkeye's acknowledging the fact that the Avengers have changed modes of transport almost on an issue-by-issue basis, and that frequently those modes of transportation don't meet with the best of ends. So this is Arrow Car number two. Last issue, Arrow Car number one got the bottom blasted out of it by the living laser and then crashed into the river. So I really enjoy that momentary a commentary on the Avengers and their ability to maintain or not maintain vehicles. So as the Avengers reach Costa Verde, they approach what they term a royal castle that is centuries old, where the Living Laser has made his headquarters in what I presume is the dictator's old quarters. It's a little bit weird. Castles aren't really a South American thing, and centuries old is also probably not a thing. Admittedly, the Spanish started setting up fortifications almost as soon as they arrived in the late 1400s, but to have built something this big centuries ago, probably not all that realistic. But again, it's not a big deal. It's just something that kind of popped into my head. Now, having said that, as the Avengers approach the castle, they are fired at by the living laser. Only this time, he is in fact using his laser cannon. And his shot connects with the Avengers' arrow car, and it goes crashing into the water. Now, of course, because Tony Stark is brilliant and thinks ahead, because he's been a superhero for a little while and understands how crazy things can get, the arrow car is also a a submarine so that when the Avengers crash into the water the plane is actually able to keep them going for a little while and they are able to approach the living lasers castle from underwater they're able to climb up the cliff and then attack the castle the living laser is not your standard villain so in a lot of ways he's not falling victim to our standard villain tropes so he immediately sends men out to go look for the avengers because he expects them to have survived when the living lasers men tell him that the avengers couldn't have survived the living laser refuses to believe it and in fact demands that his men figure out where they've gone and so shortly after they make their way up the cliff and start towards the castle the avengers are ambushed in such a manner that Cap is actually almost thrown off of the cliff and is only saved by the quick action of Goliath, at which point Hawkeye retaliates with a blast arrow, causing the living laser to be cut off from the fight and forcing the Avengers to engage the rebels at this point. I'd also like to point out that we'd see Captain America's original shield. It was on his back at one point earlier in the issue, but it was only kind of partially in panel, so that's why I didn't mention it. But now we're seeing Cap back to his full combat strength with his shield at his side. Although the Avengers are certainly able to fend off most of the Rebels, there are quite a number of Rebels, and it's pretty clear that they are heavily outnumbered. And one of the Rebels actually points out, hey, just because they're big and they're superheroes doesn't mean they're bulletproof. Now, while that's not much of a comfort to the Rebels who are fighting the Avengers, because Goliath is literally starting to swing men around to take out other Rebels, it is an interesting thing to point out that as strong and as capable as these guys are, they are still vulnerable. I mean, Captain America has super strength and speed and things like that. Goliath is super strong and he's got his size. Hawkeye is just a regular guy. Like, he's really not all that protected or invulnerable. So, Hawkeye just standing there while bullets are ringing around him, that's kind of impressive. When you realize that a lot of these characters are so vulnerable, to me, it helps emphasize their heroic nature. If they can be hurt by things like bullets, and then they stand up in front of them without hesitation, without 
without flinching, in my mind, it adds to their mythos. Now, having said that, the living laser wheels out the big guns, literally, and starts taking shots at the Avengers with his laser cannon. And as he mentioned before, it is, in fact, mammoth. It is huge. So the Avengers realize pretty quickly that they are not going to be able to hold up against firepower of that magnitude, and they make their way off the cliff into the water. Now, this is a fairly substantial cliff, so the general idea here is that any normal person would be killed by a fall from this height. So Goliath decides that he needs to keep his body tense and rigid and break the water tension for Cap and Hawkeye if they have any chance of surviving. I applaud Goliath for his effort, because I've been giving him a lot of flack lately for his lack of teamwork, lack of team mentality. And here, this is a very obvious demonstration of his teamwork. But to be clear, it's just a really bad plan. Chances are that if he keeps his body rigid and tends like that when he hits the water, it's going to kill him. Now, of course, this is a superhero comic, so it doesn't, but still, bad plan. One of the things I really enjoy here is that you get the rebel shooting at the water from the top of the cliff, hoping to hit the Avengers, and the leader of the group, who oddly enough is dressed as a federal troop, and I'm not really sure why, but the leader of this little group here tells his men to cease fire that A, nothing would have lived, and B, you know, shooting into the water like that really has no effect. The bullets will stop or break up fairly shallow into the water, so the Avengers are down there any real distance, it's going to have no effect on them. So now that the Avengers are thought to be dead, the living laser, Arthur Parks, goes back and tells Wasp that her overrated friends have been disposed of. And then it occurs to Wasp to try and figure out what's going on here, figure out who this guy is. And interestingly enough, Arthur Parks freely admits to who he is. And because of her previous discussion with Lucy Barton, Wasp now has context for who Parks is. And as Parks continues to discuss what's going on, and his plans for not turning over Costa Verde to the rebels, it's clear that Parks A has become supremely confident. So only an issue ago, issue in three quarters, we'll call it, given how far into the book we are, Parks was standing outside a window pining for his ex-girlfriend. Now he is taking it upon himself to hold control of an entire country. He's kidnapped Wasp, whom he is in love with. And it's very clear that while his his confidence is up, I think it, it's in large part due to a deteriorating mental state. Although he's not paranoid in general when it comes to, we'll call it tactical decisions, things like that, he's thinking clearly. He's obviously become very deluded and overconfident in his abilities, and he's let this situation spiral drastically away from what he intended it to be. Again, originally, Arthur was trying to get back at the guy who stole his girlfriend. He's now taken control of a country. This seems like a bit of an escalation. Now, as Arthur Parks continues on his diabolical rant, we'll call it, he is informed that once again the accursed Avengers are alive and they are attacking the castle. And we see Hawkeye making great use of some various arrows. Unfortunately, he gets a little overconfident, talks a little bit too much, and is instead knocked off of the ledge he was standing on by a blast from the living laser and is mobbed by a large number of these rebels. Captain America comes in to help rescue Hawkeye, and although Cap makes a pretty valiant effort, the rebels manage to get his shield away from him and then knock him unconscious. So at this point, the Living Laser has once again captured Hawkeye and Captain America. This leaves only Goliath available to save the day, save Wasp, stop the Living Laser. And although Goliath is able to find Wasp, the Living Laser sneaks up behind him and shoots him in the back. Now, Initially, Wasp thinks that the Living Laser has killed Hank, and this is not the case. The Living Laser has instead stunned Goliath so that he can be executed along with the rest of the Avengers at the Living Laser's pleasure. So all three Avengers are escorted to a tower, and Goliath is chained up so that he can't attempt to free himself or free the other Avengers. And here is where we get really the surprise twist of the issue, in that Goliath changes size. And in fact, Goliath actually goes down to his Ant-Man size, which I really like. 
All right, so let's backtrack for just a moment. Earlier in the issue, before the Avengers left for Costa Verde, actually just as they were getting ready to leave for Costa Verde, Goliath returned from being out, but he refused to discuss why he was out. As we find out here, while he was out, Goliath bathed himself in the rays of his experimental molecular space transformer. It's the device that he and Bill Foster have been working on, and Goliath thinks this is his best chance to be able to return to change changing size. If you remember way back when, Goliath got himself stuck at 10 feet tall because if he tried to change size, the stress would be too much for his body and it would kill him. So this is Goliath's attempt to fix that problem, to make it so that he can change size and stay alive. As we see here, Goliath's plan worked, and he is able to shrink down to Ant-Man size, thus freeing himself from the chains, and he makes his way to Wasp, who is absolutely stunned, dumbfounded, if you will, that Hank is ant size, because as far as she knows, this shouldn't be possible. Now, given the current situation, Goliath decides that the best way to take out the living laser is to disable his mammoth laser cannon, which is what's giving him the biggest advantage over the federal troops. Also, since he plans to use the cannon to execute Cap and Hawkeye, and in theory Goliath, although obviously Goliath is free, that taking out the cannon is the best plan. So of course Goliath does what he's done in the past, and it's a great bit that we haven't seen in quite a while, where Goliath goes through the machine and disables it from the inside, so that when the living laser goes to use it, nothing seems different to him, only it explodes. So instead of destroying the tower where the Avengers are being kept, it blows up and knocks him out. And with the living laser defeated, the rebels realize that their cause is lost, they flee, the Avengers free themselves, and the federal troops decide that it's time for an actual democratic election. So things in Costa Verde are looking up. So as our issue wraps up here, we see Goliath and Wasp having a conversation about what's just happened. Wasp is fairly perturbed at Goliath for not filling her in on what was going on and for scaring her, shocking her the way he did, having changed size like that. The Avengers return to New York. Goliath and Bill Foster celebrate for a moment. Uh, Hawkeye is on the receiving end of a less than pleased Black Widow. And Janet talks to her friend Lucy about getting psychological help for Arthur Parks. And the issue ends with Captain America back in Avengers Mansion, kind of thinking through things and what's going on. And suddenly from behind, a mysterious figure enters the room and gets Captain America's attention. And this will lead us into our next issue. So overall, I enjoyed this issue. I don't think I quite enjoyed it as much as the last issue, only because I think Arthur Parks goes a little over the top here at the end. The whole Costa Verde thing is a little rough. It, it's fun, but it's not great. What I do really like about the issue is that Goliath returns to normal size and regains the ability to change sizes. I think this is important for him because I think, or at least I hope, it's going to help Goliath find his way again back on the team. You know, he's been having some kind of serious personal issues while he's been stuck at 10 feet tall. And I'm hoping that his ability to once again control his powers and to once again just generally be normal will help him move forward again and again become a closer part of the team. Now I've talked a lot about how Goliath really feels like he is an outsider on the team. I don't mean that the character has the opinion they're an outsider but as the reader I feel like Goliath is the outsider and I want to see this bring Goliath back into the fold and help him be more a part of the team. So now that we've gotten the issue out of the way, let's talk about Stan Lee. As I mentioned, this is the first issue in which Stan is not the writer. So we went 34 issues written by Stan Lee. And in general, I think they're pretty good issues. And we have seen Stan grow and evolve as a writer through them. Those first few issues at times were pretty rough and things have gotten much better. Plots have gotten more complicated, relationships between characters are more fleshed out, things like that. So that's really nice. Stan overall, if we're being really fair, is mostly an ideas kind of guy. You know, the Marvel method was created because Stan was trying to write most of the books Marvel was putting out in a month and although it was only eight or ten books at the time, that's still a lot for one person to write. So he 
left a lot of the storytelling to the artist, and then Stan would come back and fill in the dialogue. Now, obviously, that has led to some minor issues in the run of Avengers we've gotten through so far, and some more significant ones uh, in the future for Marvel, again, most notably the Dark Phoenix saga. Having said that, I do think Marvel Comics would not be where it is without Stan, for a couple of reasons. For better or for worse, Stan Lee has very much made himself the public face of Marvel Comics. And while I know that angers a lot of people, especially people who are bigger Jack Kirby fans and understand Jack Kirby's contribution to Marvel, it's been good for Marvel in the fact that Stan is a very outgoing, dynamic kind of personality. So he can really sell Marvel Comics and sell the brand. And I think he did that for a long time. You know, it's obviously not true, but if you go and listen to things like the recording that Stan had everyone do for the Merry Marvel Marching Society, it fostered this image in people's minds of the Marvel bullpen that people gravitated towards, that they really enjoyed, they wanted to be a part of, and again, that helped sell Marvel comics. So from that regard, Stan's important. The other thing is that, again, I think things really had to be a collaborative effort between Stan and the artists he was working with, Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, Joe Simon, like those kinds of people. Do I think Stan Lee is responsible for everything we see in Marvel Comics? No. Do I think the artist is responsible for everything we see in Marvel Comics? That's also no. But I think the two of them together, either Stan and Jack, Stan and Steve, etc., whatever the pairing was, was able to create these important characters and these important stories. Now, with all of that in mind, I'm really looking forward to Roy Thomas. Although Stan works with a great vocabulary, his writing, his dialogue is fairly stilted and tedious to read at times. Thomas' dialogue, although it's still the 1960s in the type of comics, is much less so. Even in just this issue, things feel far more conversational, far more natural, and I'm looking forward to the direction that Thomas helps take the Avengers in. Remember, you can find us at AvengersAssembly.com, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and you can find this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. If you'd like to be a part of the conversation, send your questions and comments to andrew at avengersassembly.com. And if you like what we're doing here, make sure you write us a review on iTunes or SoundCloud. Helps us get the word out. Next week, we're going to be taking a look at Avengers number 36, The Ultroids Attack. All right, hey. All right, good job, guys. Uh, let's just not come in tomorrow. Let's just take a day. Have you ever tried shawarma? There's a shawarma joint about two blocks from here. I don't know what it is, but I want to try it.